Wanakam and a very good evening to everyone present. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you today to this month's installment of the monthly series of talks organized by the Center for Singapore Tamil Culture and the National Library Board. Before we begin, may I request all of you to kindly mute yourselves during the session. We would not want any inadvertent interruptions while the speaker is delivering his talk. Also, it would be nice to have all of you on camera if possible, because it's far more pleasant to speak to faces rather than to blank spaces. Finally, a reminder to you that this session will be recorded and uploaded to the CSTC website and placed in the public domain. Thank you for your cooperation. We are privileged to have as our guest speaker today, Professor Kwok Kian Woon, who will be speaking on an interesting topic. Professor Kwok is no stranger to many of us. He has always been an ardent advocate of multiculturalism. He has contributed extensively to this from many platforms. I had the pleasure and privilege of working with him on a multicultural, multilingual event organized by the National Arts Council of Singapore and gained significantly from this experience. Professor Kwok is from the Nanyang Technological University and he is professor of sociology. His teaching and research interests include social memory, mental health, and Asian modernity. He has strong interests in heritage and the arts, especially theater, visual art, and literature. Prof Kwok has served on the boards of the Intercultural Theater Institute, National Arts Council, National Heritage Board, Singapore Heritage Society, and Tabangong Artists in Residence. Professor Kwok's talk today is on interior landscapes, intercultural explorations, curiosity, openness, and pleasure. Professor Kwok claims that his presentation today was inspired by poet A.K. Ramanujan's The Interior Landscape, Classical Tamil Love Poems, and by the work of the Intercultural Theater Institute and the Center for Singapore Tamil Culture. Freshly introduced to the two genres in Sangam poetry, Agam, interior, and Puram, exterior, as well as to the idea of Thinai, which means landscapes, inspired him to explore as an amateur, he says modestly, the resonances and affinities between love poems in Tamil, Chinese, and Japanese. In examining poems from such diverse yet interlinked cultures, he raises a few interesting and pertinent questions. What does understanding the inner life of another person, especially one who writes in a foreign language, entail? If human beings have always known that there are others beyond their cultural community, isn't some kind of intercultural encounter a fundamental part of human experience? Isn't translation an essential human activity and one that is always imperfect, incomplete and unfinished, especially in the face of a plurality of languages, cultural forms and spatial experiences, not just across communities, but even within a single community through time and space? Do our intercultural explorations lead us to a broader and deeper understanding, not just of our other, ourselves, but also of others, and indeed, ultimately, of understanding who we are? It's now my pleasure to welcome Professor Kwok on Interior Landscapes, Intercultural Explorations. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chitra. and. Uh... I would really like to begin with, with thanks. And uh, it's a great honor and, and pleasure to, to, to be with all of you and to engage in uh, today's uh, discussion, especially also uh, 
uh, Chitra, with you uh, being my dialogue partner, and you, of course, having worked uh, on this area for the longest time, and all uh, Subra, Arun, and the CSTC team, the, the co-organizer, the uh, National Library. And also, I received lots of help from uh, Ms. Kelly Lee, who is also attending, and um, Tio Han Wee, also one of our good friends. Uh, we have, have had many such discussions. Let me just plunge in. Uh, this will be my outline. And, and although I have quite a number of slides, some I will go faster and some I will just pause to, to, to reflect a little more. So you mentioned that I have been inspired by A.K. Ramanujan. And indeed, uh, this little book has been a source of uh, joy and uh, uh, lots of... Uh, Gave, gave me lots of opportunities to reflect on a number of things which I'd like to share with you today. And I'd like to also highlight this other essay, which is also found online, which I, I found very instructive, 300 Ramayanas. And we all know the Ramayanas to be, to be spread across uh, many parts of the world, especially South Asia and Southeast Asia. And, I, and we'll come, we can say a little about that uh, later. Now, for Tamil classical poetry, uh, we, get, we see this stunning uh, conclusion in, in, in Ramanujan's uh, translation in his book, where, as you can see, I won't read out everything. Uh, the idea that these poems have lasted through 2,000 years, and they remain uh, very, very uh, central and significant in the cultural life of the Tamils. Uh, and you can see the words where passion is balanced by courtesy, transparency by ironies and nuances, impersonality by vivid detail, leanness of line by richness of implication. I, I, and it, this turns out, in fact, to be true when one reads these poems, even in translation. So one might imagine just how more beautiful uh, they are. And one is inspired to try and get to, to the original language. Let me just say that uh, this was also an introduction to me as an amateur as to Sangam literature and to be fascinated by, by these, the idea that there are these several thousand poems in classical Tamil that have been collected and put together and are still turned to by Tamils and scholars all over the world today. And uh, Chitra, you have already mentioned this broad division between Ahkam and, and Puram. Uh, and please uh, excuse me for my pronunciation of these words because I'm not a native speaker. Please feel free to correct me. I think it's very interesting that there is this uh, distinction between inner life, the interior and the exterior, the, the inner and the outer. And that these two categories of poems, love poems, which speak to experience rather than action, and then the poems dealing with war, kings, good, evil, heroes, and, and death. And of course, I think today we will look at the love poems, just a couple out of 400 love poems uh, in the Kuruntogi. Um, and I have selected uh, two, two poems which seem to be really popular, one written by a, a man and another written by a woman. And, and I was also keen to learn that the, the assigning of the, of the poems to, to actual poets, some of them have names which are actually reflective of a particular metaphor or, or a very memorable line within the poem. And we'll get to that uh, soon enough. Yeah. Agham and, and, and the idea of Tinai, the five landscapes. Uh, in this little slide here, I try to uh, summarize what I've learned from, uh, from, from, from the book and other books. Although I, I noticed that Ramanujan himself didn't quite use the word tinai, but he did refer to the five landscapes. Um, 
And uh, starting with this assertion that this idea of Akam being a poetry of the inner world, and in particular, love is taken as the, as the ideal expression. And love in all its variety and all its stages, all its phases and so on. And I was simply struck by this idea that the various phases of love and the various emotions that are linked to each phase are symbolically associated with different landscapes, in five in particular, with their characteristics, which are tied to flora, fauna, deity, the time, the season, and uh, occupation of people, uh, even the musical instruments, the musical styles, and so on. This seems to me to be so, at first, so mind-boggling. It's a kind of puzzle which, uh, which led me to, to try to understand more and more. And at the, at, at, in this slide also, you can see the five uh, T9s, uh, which I would not uh, pronounce uh, in detail, but referring to mountains as a landscape, forests, uh, the coastal areas, the seashores, the pastoral or the agricultural lands, and desert and wasteland. And you can see how these are associated with various phases of love, union, waiting, and there's a distinction between patient waiting and anxious waiting. And of course, on the negative side, infidelity, uh, resentment, uh, and of course, separation and hardship. And one could imagine that across the centuries, there have been many occasions where lovers have been separated for many reasons, including war and politics, and, and just a sheer distance uh, in, in, many, in, in a number of these countries. So for Ramanujan, T9 offers a, a life, a living vocabulary of symbols. And, and, and it's just fascinating to me that the actual landscape of, of Tamil country uh, in South, South India, in Tamil Nadu, become the interior landscape of Tamil poetry. And, and again, these conventions provide a kind of, you could call it, a, a, I call it a kind of grid, a kind of ecosystem, a kind of framework, which is quite economical in, in poetic design. And of course, this, 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 uh, well, this uh, leads us to potential com uh, comparisons with, for example, the Japanese haiku, and I learned from Arun that the Tamils also have engaged in Tamil haikus. And as, as you know, the, the haiku is so tightly packed into uh, a line of three, uh, five syllables, seven syllables, and five syllables. Whereas the love poems, especially in, 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 in the ones that we're looking at, are just of a few lines, up to five, six lines, or, or less or more, right? And this economy in poetic design, I think it makes it even more powerful. And again, you can think of Tinai as a kind of grammar. The vocabulary also creates with it, the conventions creates with it a kind of syntax. So this common language of symbols, uh, Ramanu Jin says, uh, it, it makes each poet, uh, each poem that is offered alludes in, in one way or another to other poems uh, that are written within this language. Now, I would like to raise a few questions straight away here. If Aham is poetry of the inner world and the interior landscape of Tamil poetry is symbolically, and I, I think I read one uh, uh, essay by Dr. Chitra using the word symbiosis or symbiotic relationship associated with the physical and material, social, cultural landscape of Tamil country. If that's the case, and if the classical Tamil poets spoke this common language, uh, dependent on literary conventions, denied poetics that serve as a grammar, would it be possible for non-Tamils to have access to enter into the inner world of Tamil poets, and by extension, the inner lives of Tamils? And I think this is a, a question which is quite interesting. Are we, is anybody saying that if you are not a Tamil, it will be almost impossible or 
very, very supremely difficult for you to do that. Right? And more generally, what would it take for any person to venture into the interior landscape of another person if one does not share and speak a common symbolic vocabulary? Uh, you, some of you might know that these questions which have troubled people like Arun and myself um, are also springing from our Singapore experience. And, and we can say a little more about that later. Now, I think the answers could be found by us taking the trouble, making the effort, giving time to attempt to enter into the inner world of Tamil classical poetry, which we will do in a very uh, modest way today. Right? And when we say we and, and us, uh, I'm of course referring to those of us who are non-Tamils because Tamil to us is a foreign language. Uh, and we know that we cannot do with some kind of translation. And in today, of course, uh, in today's talk, we turn to Raman Nujan, who himself has been a very uh, competent translator. And we, there's a sense that translation is almost always imperfect and incomplete because of the nuances and the richness in the original poem. But I like to think that knowing what I know about our Tamil uh, friends and their families in Singapore, uh, it could be that uh, various Tamils, depending on their education, their exposure, maybe also their family upbringing, they too may also be not necessarily as familiar with classical Tamil and with the landscapes of Tamil country while living in Singapore. And I just wonder, for these Tamil friends, wouldn't this also involve some kind of translation? After all, the classical Tamil of 2000 years ago and the Tamil today, one imagines, just as for Chinese, the Chinese during the time of the Tang Dynasty and the Chinese of today. And even the Chinese today who are conversant and competent in Chinese, wouldn't they too need to have some process of translation? So these are some questions on my mind. And I will say something about translation now, turning to again Ramanujan. When he translated these poems into English, he says that trying to translate a poem into a foreign language is at the same time trying to translate a foreign reader into a native one. And this strikes me as being a very tall order. And if, to what extent can one really do that? One can try though. In, the, in the act of translation, what we are doing, those of us who are bilingual or multilingual uh, in varying uh, ways, this involves going back and forth what is familiar in native experience and what is unfamiliar in foreign experience. So this familiar and unfamiliar dynamic in the translation process, I should think also applies to natives trying to understand their own culture, especially their own culture being very rich, lasting thousands of years and being very complex and so on. Let's plunge in and look at one of, I think from what I gather, one of the most well-loved Kuruntugai, Kuruntugi poems. And uh, I must trouble uh, Dr. Chitra to help us read out this short poem. Dr. Chitra. Kurundukai. Napade, 40. Yayum, Nyayum, Yara Giero, Endeum, Nundeum, Emure Kelir, Yanum, Nium, Ebury Aridum, Sembula Penir Pola, Unbuddha Nenjum, Tang Kalan than away. Sembula Penira. Thank you, Prof. Thank you so much, sir, Dr. Chitra. So just listening to uh, Dr. Chitra reciting this poem, um, I, I told Arun that I, I would like to be reincarnated just to learn Tamil, you know? Uh, the, 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 the cadence, the, the rhythms, uh, the way the words sort of flow, you know, including the opening words, right? Yayum, yayum. Right? Of course, uh, you know, it's, I, I feel helpless uh, and I feel that I need to, to, to turn to, 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 to 
to, for some help. Yeah? And of course, we, help, we have help in the form of translation. And, and of course, this is uh, Ramanujan's uh, translation. And the, the, the name that is, the, the, the name of the poet here, Shem, Shempulayarnira, uh, sorry again for my pronunciation, actually that translates into the poet of the red earth and pouring rain. And as you can see from the translation, that's a central metaphor in the poem. What could my mother be to yours? What kin is my father to yours anyway? And how did you and I meet ever? But in love, our hearts are as red earth and pouring rain mingled beyond parting. This poem is set within the Kurinchi landscape. And the Kurinchi is a flower which, of which that landscape, this mountainous landscape is named after. Uh, and you can see uh, images of this flower in, over Google. And it's a very special flower, purple blue in color. And it blooms once in 12 years or thereabouts. And therefore, it's also associated with puberty. Right? In this Hinai, the love relationship is clandestine before marriage. In some other Tinais, it is after marriage, but in this Tinai, it's almost always and perhaps always before marriage. So there is this sense of uh, uh, tension, you know, of two people coming together. Right? And there's also the rainy season, which I found out uh, from Ramanujan's, uh, Ramanujan's uh, little chart in his book, that the, uh, the rainy season is more associated with Mulai, uh, uh, the forests. But again, it, is, it has been said that in Tamil classical poetry, the Tinais can be fused and can mix together. And this again shows a certain kind of flexibility and fluidity, which, which makes the whole question of this book, symbolic vocabulary, even more exciting. Right? And you notice that throughout the poem, the flower, the Korinchi flower is not mentioned, but it would seem to a Tamil reader that that is clearly present, even not explicitly mentioned. And it, it again goes very well with the substance of the poem, this sense of awakening, uh, a rite of passage, sharing intimacy with another person, a kind of new stage uh, in one's life. Yeah? Now, as it turns out, there are many uh, movies, Tamil movies and songs and videos, which in fact use the lyrics and the words and the cadence, the rhythms, the rhymes of this particular poem. Now, because of time, I would not attempt to uh, go into this video, but I would encourage everybody to do that because the tune and the song and the images will just keep playing in your head for a few days after that. Right? So I just want to ask the question, why and how does a single ancient poem continue to stir this kind of imagination? That's the power of poetry and of this particular poem. And this is just a, a screenshot of that, that, that YouTube, and you can see how it opens up with Yayum, Yayum. And it's, people also talk about the, the Yayum song, right? They, they don't even have to refer to red earth and, uh, and pouring rain, for example. Just the first few words to stir the imagination. Now, some of you also may know that in the London Tube, uh, in one year, this poem was put up as a poster along with other poems. And this translation here also from, from uh, Ramanujan, Professor Ramanujan, is slightly different, especially the bottom half, right? But in love, our hearts have mingled like red earth and pouring rain. So again, even in translation, there could be some, in fact, a lot of room for, for difference and for vari variation and so on. This then leads me to two, two translations, Ramanujan's and Professor George Hart's. Uh, now, I could not, uh, I did not have the time to establish Professor Hart's uh, 
translation, but this is what I found uh, in Wikipedia. And you can see again this the two variations, right? But but whichever translation, you can see that the message, the substance is coming through uh, in English, even though we mean it may not capture all the nuances and the, the detail and the, uh, of, of the original Tamil poem. Now here, I want to move on and ask all of us to hold on to this line and to this thought. How did you and I meet ever? And but, there's a but there. And in George Hart's uh, translation, I and you, how do we know each other? And yet, now you can see, this was how it appeared in the translations. But I've highlighted these lines because there's a sense of puzzlement here. And it's a wonderful, wondrous kind of puzzlement. Almost you can say we are as if the protagonist and we ourselves are, are awestruck. You know? We are amazed. Yeah? Uh, we are astonished. What are the odds of two strangers developing an intimate, profound, deep relationship? Now, if you think about the time of classical Tamil poetry 2,000 years ago, people living in maybe small groups in villages, the chances of two young persons not having parents who know each other, that's already something to contemplate. Now, we're not, and we're not also talking a time in the contemporary era where young people and, and, and people seeking partners can also find themselves through something like dating apps, for example, right? We are now talking about a time whereby what are the odds of two persons having this very deep relationship, coming to know each other and developing these kinds of bonds? And I would say that these apply to bonds of friendship, affection, and understanding that are not confined to love relations, to love relationships. You can think, for example, of... Uh, male, male, female, female, and even male, female friendships, which are not necessarily romantic or erotic or, or sexual. And again, there is this kind of puzzlement. How did you and I meet ever? How do we know each other? So in the Chinese language, uh, I'm always taken up by this set of three terms, not used, often not used together, used very separately on, on different occasions. Uh, this kind of affinity in which you did not choose. Yeah? You, you did not have quite choose. It was forged by fate, chance, destiny. It's a kind of serendipity. But yet, it is an affinity. And then, mo uh, qi, a kind of tacit, silent understanding or rapport between persons. Yeah? And then the last one, qi in referring to somebody who's a kindred spirit. And there's a little story here of a, 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 a zitta player um, in, who was very much appreciated by an ordinary woodcutter. And then when the woodcutter died, he found that the one person who could appreciate his music was gone. Right? So this idea of being attuned and, and the idea of yin, yin means uh, a sound, you know, a, a tune, sharing an intimate friendship. And I've always wondered whether these terms could be translatable in other languages and what would these other terms be? And what would be the experience of this kind of affinity, this kind of tacit understanding, this idea of being a kindred spirit? And, and this again is something that, that we, we have to understand this kind of possibility, possibility, this kind of potentiality, right? So here we are. For me now, if somebody mentions red earth and pouring rain, that would be my code word, my code term for this kind of possibility. Yeah? I have now incorporated these English words, and I must find the, the Tamil words, as part of my vocabulary to talk about this wondrous possibility yeah? that two persons of different backgrounds, including ancestry, you know, I do not know your parents or your ancestors, and, and my ancestors were very different from yours. It could be Chinese and you are Indian or whatever, and so-called races, right? 
But this possibility and this capacity, this potentiality to reach out and to reach in to another person's inner life, we know this to be true. It is possible and we can develop this capacity. Right? Now, on the other hand, we know that relationships are not necessarily sustained. Many things can happen along the way. Many things can conspire to keep red earth and pouring rain. By now, you can see how much I love this term. The two may not necessarily come together and continue to be together. And therefore, the theme of separation in, in, in these love poems is also very strong. And I've chosen one here written by a woman poet and also appearing in the same book uh, uh, by uh, of translations, right? And it is said quite clearly for many commentators in the Palai landscape. And again, now I have to trouble uh, Dr. Chitra to, to help us recite the poem. My pleasure, Prof. So this is Kurundukai 130. Nilam Tottu Puhar Vanam Erar Vilangir Munmir Kalin Sellar Natin Natin Urin Urin Kudimurai Kudimurai Terin Kedunaram Ularo Nam Kadalore Veli Vidyar. Thank you. Thank you. So Again, just listening, you can feel that this is really something unusual. And, and if you look back, uh, sorry, if you look back at, uh, if you look at the translation now, you see when, when Dr. Chitra recited uh, Natin, Natin, Wurin, Wurin, again, pardon my pronunciation, you see the structure of the poem, right? The, the way it goes, he just cannot have dug up and entered the earth, nor climbed the skies, nor waded barefoot through all those seas he must have met. If only one looks for him in land after land, town after town, nothing, nothing, urin, urin, eh? clan after clan, or family after family, our lover, the one that you love, cannot slip through the cordon, can he? He cannot evade. He cannot run away from us, can he? Right? And again, I, I think uh, on the one hand, you have this very sad pathos of very long separation and not being able to be reunited. And on the other hand, for me, there's a, even a, a touch of, of, of humor, you know? Uh, uh, when I read this poem, I, the first thing I thought was, was what uh, my young friends would call ghosting. You know, when, when, when you have entered into some kind of casual relationship, especially, again, through a dating app and you, you follow up and then suddenly the person disappears. So where, where has this person gone? You know, yeah. So let's move on now. What might be our first responses to these poems? Well, of course, different people can, have, can respond differently. But depending on one's curiosity and one's openness, it might just be possible, right? as Ramanujan hopes in the work of translation, that we experience something of what a native experiences. Something, not everything, something. Uh, even a woman poet 2,000 years ago. Right? Perhaps more, we can experience something of what the poet is trying to convey, something of her deepest life experience. Now, if this in fact does happen, I think that this might be called aesthetic pleasure. Now, it's, it's a little, little ironic to say this, given how sad the poem might be. But again, that is that, that is, that's the experience to say, wow, I can enter into the inner life of this person in some fashion, to some extent, to some degree. And yes, it happens by chance. But I think it's more than chance. It requires agency on our part. 
we need to nudge ourselves or be nudged by others to be more receptive to this kind of poem. And I'll come back to this again. These are further reflections. And if you don't mind, I will just go very quickly. Uh, you can read a little more quickly than I, I can speak. So again, these questions about can something that be that is, is so deep like love, and if it's so, if it's expressed in such a particular uh, form of uh, articulation uh, with its own conventions and its own grammar, can it in fact be shared? If 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 people say that love is a universal phenomenon, yeah, can we just say it is universal and leave it as that? So we cannot say for sure that you know what one experiences in love uh, is universal or can be shared. We can only find out by attempting to enter into the inner world of a foreign person from a foreign culture. And in so doing, we don't do it cold. We don't do it blind. We bring our cultural knowledge and our life experiences to this encounter. We don't leave that at the door before entering. Right? So in what follows, and I'm conscious of the time, we'll look at just a few love poems in Chinese and Japanese. And so doing, we explore resonances and affinities in these interior landscapes of the poems. And no surprises for guessing, there might be something which is not equivalent to Tinai's but it could be comparable in one way or another. Certainly not equivalent because there are associations between experiences, emotions, and landscapes, including seasons, weather, the moon, flowers, trees, and birds. So let's plunge in now. This is a poet, a woman poet, and I've especially tried to choose women poets uh, for reasons which you might guess. Uh, Maybe the women are more interesting than the men in love. Yeah? Now, Li Qingzhao of the Song Dynasty. This is a little of the background. And of course, you can imagine those times of upheaval when people were separated for many years, not just months, but years. Yeah? And again, just as some of this Tamil classical poetry are studied in schools, if anyone has gone through a strong curriculum in Chinese literature. And I'm afraid very few of us have, even among the Chinese in Singapore. It's the older generation, and it's some young students who have had a certain kind of upbringing, certain kinds of parental influence, and, 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 and so on, who, if you ask them about this poet and her poems, they could quite readily start to recite some of these poems, right? And for those who want to have an English source, there's this book, which I, also, I will also take the translations from. So now let's look at this poem, all right? I put the Chinese words on the left and the phonetics, the pin in on the right, just to give a sense of, of the flow. Now, for reasons of time, I will not read out the poem, uh, but let's look at the translation, right? These six lines, in some ways, how do they resonate with the short uh, Kurun-toki poems that we find in Tamil classical literature, separated by vast differences in culture, in time, and so on, right? Last night, the rain was intermittent, the wind blustery, deep sleep did not dispel the lingering wine. I tried asking the maid, raising the blinds, Who's, who, who said the crab apple blossoms were as before? Don't you know, don't you know, the greens must be plum and the reds spindly. Now, in my first reading of this poem, I had very little clue what was happening. And only by, by, by discussing with uh, my, my research friends and, and, and so on, who were schooled in, 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 in this literature, then I could see that there are a few layers here. Uh, first of all, the reference to the rain and the wind. Again, these are 
seasonal and these are references to landscapes. But asking the maid to raise the blinds and the maid seemed to be giving the poetess an answer which she thought may please her, which is that the crab apple blossoms outside have not changed. It's something which the poetess would like to believe in because it would mean that not much time has passed in this separation. But she refuses to fall totally into this delusion and asks, don't you know, don't you know, they are not quite the same as before. The greens must now be plum, must, must see more green, and the reds must be spindly and disappearing. Let me move on to another. This again is a very famous poem. And if you allow me, uh, you can see that just looking on the right hand side using the phonetics, right? The words seem to remind me of some poems like, like Yarum Yarum. You know? it, the, the, the way it begins has a certain kind of cadence which is totally unmistakable. Right? And in this case, it's Xin Xin Mi Mi, Leng Leng Qing Qing, Qi Qi, Chan Chan, Qi Qi. Now, if you turn to a Chinese friend who was good in this literature, the moment you say Xin Xin Mi Mi, it's likely that this person will continue with the rest of the poem. Right? Now, what's happening in this poem? Let's look at the translation. Uh, I won't read all of it. Maybe I'll just read parts of it. Yeah? Uh, searching, hunting, seeking, looking. This is uh, Professor Robert Egan's translation for Xin Xin Mi Mi. Searching, hunting, seeking, looking. So chilly and yet so clear. Distress, dismal and forlorn. Warm a while, then cold again. It's that season, the worst for taking care of yourself. How can two or three cups of weak wine hold up against the strength of the evening wind? The wild goose, the wild geese have past flown, truly saddening the heart. What's more, I recognize them from years past. Now, I won't read the rest because you can see the later references to flowers, uh, yellow petals, the paulonia trees and the fine rain. And this scene, how could the word sorrow even suffice to describe what I'm going through now? You can see here that although Chinese references to flora and to fauna may not be codified in the way that Tamil Sangam poetry have, you know, this kind of schema that they have in the five T9s, there is still some kind of institutionalization or routinization or, or, or a way in which these references and these conventions are, are become common knowledge, become part of a common symbolic vocabulary. I'll just take the, the, the reference to the wild geese or the wild goose is a metaphor for receiving a message from somebody far away, somebody that's dear to you. It's also a metaphor for a person who is retiring. You know, the image of the wild geese descending on the sand bank, especially one who did not get to fulfill his literate and his social role in the courts and in the aristocracy and so on, as a scholar, for example. And, and there are many other, these kinds of resonances. So, and, and the idea that for the, this poetess, I recognize them from years past. So the wild geese have been returning and returning, but not the lover, you see. Again, uh, if we have time to go into the YouTube and so on, Li Qingzhao and these two poems and other poems have found their way to Chinese popular culture, into uh, choruses and even into rap music. 
especially by, by this Taiwanese uh, girl band uh, by the name of S.H.E. She. Right? So again, this is just for reference. Now, because of the time, let me turn quickly now to Japanese poetry. Uh, and again, there's this wonderful book uh, published in 2018, which the National Library has. Uh, I kept renewing this book until the time where I feel that I have to just go out and buy it. Uh, so don't worry, you have copies in, in National Library. And in haiku, there's always, unless the convention is being contravened, there is a seasonal reference, a subject, kindai. Right, and a key goal, a word or a phrase that designates one of the four or five seasons. There's a fifth season called the new year. Again, you see, this is a convention, right? There is no, it's not something of the five T nice, but you will find, for example, Kigo dictionaries and Kigo discussions, you know. Uh, 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 yes. Sorry to interrupt. You asked me to give you a reminder for a three-minute call. So okay. you have three more good. minutes. Thank very you. good. Very good. So let me move very fast and I will depend on you to look at these poems without me having to read them. This one line, five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. And again, a woman poet. Reference to the moonlight. And this is, we know, the fact that her husband was dying, right? And in the second poem, again, the husband was near death. Up close to his face, near death, I said, the moon shining. And the third poem here is written 12 years later in the 1940s. The first poem was earlier. 12 years later, again, a seasonal reference, the fierce snow and the recollection of how I was hugged, breathless. And, and another woman poet here, yeah. longing for love, I place a single strawberry in my mouth. And strawberry too is a seasonal reference, right? And the second one, uh, you can read for yourself, your letter concealed in my kimono's breast pocket, basking in winter sun, right? Now, Masajo, Suzuki Masajo, it's a lovely poet. I found another poem, which I really like. And this is the next one. Pouring each other beer, these men with whom I shall never make love. Right? And I just wonder whether pouring each other beer has now become a kigo. You know? Is it a seasonal reference? Like maybe summer, for example. Okay. And you can find that haiku has become internationalized. So there are French and, and Canadians writing haiku. And the women have become, they feel some kind of solidarity and they share their poems related to the inner life. And this is something that you can find on the net. Uh, this talk with many, many examples of haiku written by Japanese, uh, Canadians and French. Yeah. Now, I could not resist throwing in a Malay poem, and this is by a Malaysian poet, uh, Usman Uwang, Awang, and this Kekase or Beloved. Right? And again, if you just, sorry, the letters are very small, but look at the references uh, in, in relation to Beloved. The froth of the sea, the, the waves, the clouds, the mountains, uh, the star of the east, the darkened moon, the sun, and so on. So again, you see, in Malay poetry, you can find lots of references to, 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 the, to the Malayan or the Southeast Asian landscape. And this poem was recently also translated into Chinese by Dr. Liu Suriniata. Right? Now, I'm coming to the end now. Please bear with me. You have all these kinds of efforts. On the right, the book by Dr. Liu, uh, translating poems, Malay poems in, from Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia. On the left, uh, a very recent book, Singapore poems uh, uh, translated into English from Tamil, uh, Chinese, and Malay. Right? And these are efforts going on in Singapore. And the National Library has these books. Okay. Uh, Dr. Chitra has already given part of my argument. I think 
intercultural encounters are a fundamental part of human experience. And I think that we have to ask ourselves, what would it take for us to understand the inner lives of others beyond all these exterior identities, which are now coming to the fore so contentiously, right? You, you can see that happening even in Singapore, especially over race and so on. So I think translation is an essential human activity and all the more so in the kind of the fact that we have this plurality of languages, cultural forms and spatial experiences. And again, even within a single community, whether Tamils or Chinese, we too have this kind of plurality within. Right? And poetry is a good start, a good entry point um, because of this kind of symbolic vocabulary and, tem and, and grammar, right? As Ramanujan says, you know, this helps us make, inf helps the poets make infinite use of finite means. Within the grid, they can have such creative uh, use, right? And so on. And then you can turn to, of course, the full range of all the arts for these many entry points. Now, I'd like to pick up a, 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 a sentence here from Tan Feng, uh, who, of course, has been in the forefront of translation in Singapore. This idea that, of course, many things are lost in translation. But in a multilingual society like Singapore, I'm quoting, there are also important things that can only be found in translation. So just what a beautiful idea that is. Now, this is my second last, last few slides. Let me be very quick. You know, people talk about universality. There is no quick shortcut to universality. We are translated human beings, beings always having to translate, even in the face of the translatable, right? And in relation to our natural landscapes in this small and fragile planet, right? All the more we need to cultivate and share our interior landscapes in reference to our exterior landscapes. Our explorations will lead us to a broader and deeper understanding of each other and of ourselves as social beings and planetary agents. And you know all this discussion about the Anthropocene, we are planetary agents doing things to the earth. Right? And in this work, we are always beginners and amateurs hoping to do better. Let me just end with, again, the way I started. Raman, Ramanujan and his essay. I wouldn't retell this story of a man in the village who was not very interested in the, Ramana, uh, in the Ramayana epic and his wife had to nudge him and for the first three nights he was sleeping all the way until his, he had to confess to his wife that yes, he was sleeping. So only on the fourth night, the wife brought him there, nagged him, sat next to him, made sure that he listened and he got so enthralled by really listening that in the part when Hanuman jumps into the oceans to find the ring, in the part when Ramanujan calls for help, this man who took no interest in literature and the arts, he jumped into the oceans to recover the ring. Right? So, what happens when you really listen? What happens when you really read? What happens when you really reach out and reach in? Things of many wondrous kinds happen. Okay. Thank you, uh, Chitra. I will stop sharing now. Thank you, Prof, for that very illuminating and wonderful comparative uh, paper that you have given us. I think all of us have been deeply moved by the ideas that you have uh, placed in, uh, before us. Let's begin the Q&A. May I request those of you who want to ask questions to use the hand raise feature on Zoom, or you may also use the Zoom chat feature. Um, also, please unmute yourselves and switch on your cameras when it is your turn to speak. So um, let me request uh, you to now um, start with the Q&A. Anyone? Okay, then let me just kick off with a question, Prof, that I'm uh, very keen to um, find out from you. In your presentation, 
one thing that stood out for me being an eco critic was the way in which human embedment in nature is emphasized in these poems so um, you know these are all obviously very very intimate poems uh, that talk about uh, human exchanges and interiority yet uh, i observed how uh, in the mention for instance about the red earth and pouring rain uh, that mingles like two lovers hearts or again in the exquisitely lyrical poem by li uh, qingzhou uh, last night the rain was intermittent the wind blustery there seems to be a deep awareness of the non human world and how it constantly intrudes into moderates qualifies the world of human intimacy and interiority these are two such distinct traditions japanese chinese are two distinct traditions as also tamil and you know east asian traditions right they are such distinct traditions yet this attention to the natural world outside the world of culture even as they are discussing intimate things is striking for me it is something that is very thought provoking and i would like to have your thoughts on this thank you uh, thanks uh, dr chitra and earlier on for also sharing your your work on 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 tinai poetics and and how it relates to contemporary efforts to 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 discuss uh, feminist and uh, environmental themes and so on um y- yes perhaps what we can say is that traditional cultures uh this might sound a little uh, simplistic but traditional cultures maybe because of a closer uh, grounding in the land to the seasons and to to agricultural life and so on has this kind of a uh, uh lively and deep relationship to the earth in a way that we urbanites and we moderns do not have and in some ways uh one of the definitions of modernity is this sense of overcoming and mastering over nature and and being able to explain everything in the form of uh, scientific knowledge and mathematical models and so on so in, in some ways i mean if it's not too far fetched i would say that what the uh, corona virus has reminded us and and all these issues about zoonotic transmissions uh, that uh, and of course the environmental uh, c- catastrophes and climate change is that we must not lose this vital uh, what you call embeddedness you know, of our culture within nature yeah so i hope that that answers your question yes that's wonderful mm-hmm. arun i see you have your hand up um would yes, you uh, thanks uh, uh, prof chitra i i wanted to follow up on your question and uh, before that uh, allow me to express my great uh, gratitude to prof kwok uh, who always invests his uh, discourses with uh, passion intellect and a genuine concern um, you know that uh, we don't often find um, in in this kind of talks so thank you prof um, my question follows up in the sense you know uh, almost every language um, talks about the human connection to nature but in the case of tene there is a codification there is an economy of expression there is a stylization as an institutionalization of word you use do you find um, that in the chinese poetry which also has very great and very deep and very long traditions that they too have some kind of like the wild geese for example is that a, a a a code a symbolic thing that immediately conjures up or or reveals a whole plethora of other information that you don't have to state you know just by one word one idea one symbol you open up uh, you know a, 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 an ecosystem as it were is that part of their tradition or in in the japanese as well thank thank you arun um uh... i i would say um, based on my limited knowledge and 
many of you will know that I'm more of a social scientist than a, than a literature researcher or literary critic. Uh, based on, on my knowledge, uh, Tine seems to go very far in this. To this, this codification could, even in Ramanujan's case, could even be mapped out in a chart or, or diagram. You know? Now, you don't find this to the same extent, but the answer is yes. If you are, a, if you are schooled in the literary conventions in, of Chinese and, 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 and Japanese, uh, when these words appear, you will be sussing out intellectually what might be the context. Is it a, a longing because of separation or is it something even? So I give you, for example, the, the wild goose right, has appeared uh, in the, the poems that, that uh, Du, du Fu, and you know Du Fu of the Tang Dynasty, in, in one of the poets of the Tang Dynasty, wrote to Li Bai, or what sometimes we call Li Po, right? Because at that time, in such a huge uh, country, for two poets, number one, to get to even know each other, to get to even meet, and then maybe something like 15 years later, don't meet, uh, and then, and then for, for Du Fu to write a poem you know, about dreaming of Li, Li, Li Bai and so on, the, the, the figure of the wild geese or the wild goose appears, you know, and there the layers of meaning related to, you know, your, your service to the country has not been appreciated, you know, uh, and now you are in this state and I'm thinking of you and so on, and I haven't heard from you. Are you, are you safe, my brother? You know, that kind of feeling. Yeah? So, yes, um, the, the conventions are, are strong. Same with the flora and the fauna, yeah. especially the flora. So if, if one wants to do a dissertation on this, I'm, I'm sure there maybe they are. You just bring up all these references to, to strawberries or to, to, to whatever tree and, and so on. So, but not quite in the way that the Tamils have got tine. Yeah. Thank you. Tine is uh, very uh, interesting in that um, it's not, uh, as, as, uh, as I'm sure, Prof, uh, you, you, we have discussed earlier, it's not uh, only uh, a landscape, it is also the, the, the community, the instruments, the musical instruments. So what for me is amazing is it's a kind of a guest out in that it is both uh, nature and culture combined together. So it's, you know, non-human nature as well as human culture. They're both embedded in Tinai and that makes it uh, extremely unique. And as you said, uh, it's a very good way of bringing a whole community, a whole landscape to life with just a few uh, references. So th that's amazing. And that uh, harks back to what you talked about earlier about the cryptic nature of poetry. We have a very interesting question uh, on chat from Ila, Ila Varagan. Uh, and he bemoans the fact, I think even as he asks his question, he says, uh, you know, poetry as reflected in this talk is, you know, about very intimate and deep communication and it's communicating deep feelings, intimate feelings. So can poetry still serve as a tool for professing love? If not, where could it have lost its way? And how do we revive this? That's a very interesting question. Well, um, if you ask me, uh, my answer has to be yes. Uh, as, uh, you see, the, the whole question of love uh, under contemporary conditions too is, uh, you know, I, earlier on I mentioned this idea of uh, dating apps and so on. When I learned this from my young <laughs> colleagues, you know, it's, it's mind-boggling to me yeah? because it's as if algorithms are doing the work. <laughs> yeah. But why not our human algorithms and these deeper layers of ourselves? And, and, and why not, instead of swiping left or right, you know, pick up a pen yeah? to articulate your innermost thoughts about the person that you love? Yeah. So uh, I think that too is for me a kind of healthy resistance against uh, uh, 
sort of maybe bad users of technology, you know, and, and so on. So, and I, I think also, I mean, I came across an article uh, in a Japanese newspaper written in English by a foreigner about the haiku that you can recall and recite during Valentine's Day. Mm. So, I, I mean, the fact that the uh, Red Earth and, and pouring rain is so much all over the place in Tamil movies and Tamil songs, you know, with their songs and dance. And Arun reminds me that, you know, there are Tamil movies, three hours, there must be at least 50 songs or something. And the idea of the spoken word and the, the singing. And by the way, those Chinese poems too are meant to be sung to a particular tune, mm. you see. And the whole idea of sound and oral tradition and recitation, which you also find, by the way, in the uh, Sufi tradition mm. of the Kawali, mm. and in which even the relationship between the between a human person and the divine is a relationship between a lover and a beloved. Mm. Mm. And we, the moment you get into all this, it's like, wow, it doesn't end, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you, know you know, Prof, it's a very interesting point that you raised about Sufism because there are parallels in uh, the uh, Hindu tradition as well. Very often when you have uh, <coughs> Mira Bhajans, for instance, this is, uh, you know, uh, songs, uh, uh, you know, uh, sung in praise of Lord Krishna by a devotee, you find that she in fact, um, uh, you know, connects her love with the Lord um, like a, a, a lover, you know, so it's it's not so much the the God and the devotee. It's more like a, a lover singing to uh, her lover, uh, a love singing to her lover. So it's like you know, it's there's these kinds of in um, you could say um, um, some kind of a coming together of both sacred and secular, uh, which is very interesting, and it seems to be happening across traditions, as you pointed out, which, which is amazing. Um, we also have, you know, uh, similar to uh, Mira Bhajans, we have uh, Andal in, in Tamil, we, where Andal is singing about the Lord. And it's, it's an amazing kind of um, way in which you see the sacred and the secular coming together. Uh, and that is so inspiring. So I think what, you know, to go back to what uh, Ila is saying, I think this idea of poetry being something that breaks boundaries, you know, boundaries that are uh, seen by many to be inflexible, like the sacred and the secular, like the idea of, you know, culture versus nature. Uh, you know, I, I, the idea of bringing these kinds of so-called binaries together, that seems to be one of the most interesting aspects of poetry in my in my humble opinion so that is something that i think is worth um, probably exploring further the idea of how poetry facilitates this kind of breaking of very entrenched binaries mm. you know that, that yeah. that's very interesting yes so, chitra if i may you you have said it so well i i would just like to add with just one example of uh, you know, uh, nowadays, you, this, thanks to technology, you have access to, for example, uh, Kawali uh, performances and, and so on. And uh, it, precisely these many songs, many of them are just what you said. This relationship between lover and beloved, between human and, 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 de uh, and, and, and the divine. You know? And there must be something quite profound here in which the human experience of love can be so profound and in some ways even earth shattering, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and it probably intimates that kind of relationship with the deity. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, you know, I, I, I don't often recall lines very well, but when, when there was this uh, Kawali performance in which translation is provided, mm -hmm. I think the original language could be a beautiful language like Urdu, for example. Uh, and when I saw the subtitle, I was amazed by the by this lyric. And you know, the man was singing and playing the harmonium and the and the tabla and so on. And it just goes on like that. And I saw the, the lyrics appearing before me. And the lyrics were, I will take you into my eyes and hide you under my eyelids. Mm -hmm. 
And you know, in this time where everybody is wearing a mask, our only communication is through the eyes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very true, Prof. We have two hands raised here. One is uh, Professor Tinnapin. He will go first and then uh, Mr. Sasi Tharat. Can we have uh, Prof. Tinnapin, please? Um, Prof, please unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Recently, I read an article, research article, written by Professor Kozan Raman, a mm. comparative study of a Tamil and Japanese prosody. Mm. Conclusion of this paper is this <clears throat> the haiku and venba appear to have uh, originated from a common source due to parallel developments certain changes have occurred in the tamil uh, meter as well as in the japanese one therefore uh, the conclusion of this paper he has compared haiku and uh, tamil prosody one kind of sindhial venba and then he has come to the conclusion, actually, uh, <coughs> the technique has been lengthened from the common source of Japanese and uh, Tamil. Therefore, because even in Japanese, they are unable to find the origin of haiku, uh, very difficult to find the origin there. Therefore, according to his conclusion, he has compared so many things with Japanese and uh, Tamil. One of the features is comparison of tragedy. Uh, prosody. Therefore, his conclusion is there are there are some relations. Therefore, from the same origin, haiku and uh, another form of Sindhi Alvenba have come from the same origin. This is the information I wish to tell you. Thank you, Prof. Tinnapan. I think that is a fascinating idea and I'm not surprised for the simple reason that we always talk about colonial, colonial modernity what we fail to remember or recall is that prior to European colonization and colonialism, there was a very thriving, uh, you know, modernity in Asia and uh, between Asian countries and in, in, in between Africa and Asia. We had a very thriving modernity. We had uh, a lot of uh, intercultural exchanges. And therefore, I think, you know, it is not at all surprising for me to hear this fascinating information. Okay, um, Prof. Uh, Kwok, would you like to add anything before we go to uh, Mr. Sasitharan? Oh, thank you. That was fascinating. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tinapan. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Sas uh, Mr. Sasitharan, would you like to? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sitra. Uh, Prof. Kwok, uh, it's a pleasure to have you discourse on Tamil poetry. It's a pleasure to hear you discuss on poetry at all. I mean, it's just wonderful to listen to you. I, I just wanted, I have a few uh, thoughts which I just wanted to share. One is, uh, first and foremost, I think uh, 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 this, this uh, connection uh, that human beings have with nature is not such a ancient thing. Uh, you know, uh, 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 in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, we had the lines uh, uh, to see the world uh, in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, to hold infinity in the palm of my hand an eternity in an hour. William Blake, you know, uh, uh, spoke about this in this way uh, in, uh, in the 19th century. And uh, uh, it, it's interesting because I think uh, you, you also, there was also a question about love and, you know, how, uh, how we've lost the ability to, to express ourselves through love. Well, I, I think that we, these, these poems, uh, at least in, in, uh, in the tradition of, 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 of the West, have always been associated with ecstasy. It's been associated with auguries. It's been associated with a kind of rhapsody uh, of the mind and the soul, you know. And uh, uh, to bring it back to, uh, to, to Indian aesthetics, uh, in theater, there is this uh, notion called bhava, which the actor is supposed to imbibe in performance. It is a state of being. Uh, it's a state of consciousness, a state of doing, a commitment, a discipline, a uh, 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 competence in a technicality, a skill. And it's all of these things, I think, that uh, enables uh, that kind of poetry uh, to be. And, and let's not forget that, as you, as you mentioned, uh, Prof. Kok, that these poems were meant to be spoken and sung. They were meant to be heard. <laughs> 
And I think the oral tradition has, has a great uh, uh, value in adding to the fact why I think we were thinking about nature in this way and why these quite distinct and different uh, uh, concepts were yoked together and yoked in poetry. It's, it's the conceit of poetry. Uh, and I think that's what poets are supposed to do. Just that, I just wanted to comment. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sasi. That was so... Uh, I, I, I can't add any more to that. And in fact, uh, I think Arun will make you volunteer for the next talk, you know. Uh, it has been. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sasi. And I, I think uh, what you say about the theatre, you, you see, uh, we, we, just like in Singapore, we, we, we keep uh, compartmentalizing races. We shouldn't also be compartmentalizing the arts, you know, as if there was no continuum between them. You know, one of my favorite pieces of, of music on, on, on the zither, and the, the gu qin, the, the instrument, the string instrument, is the, the it's a classical piece that's entitled "Wild Geese Descending on the Sandbank," you know, and and so the, the continuum between music and poetry and perhaps uh, theater and dance and so on. So, uh, Sasi, thank you. I, I should uh, take you up on on, on a offline for another discussion. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Sasi, for that very, very uh, enlightening and illuminating point. In fact, we've had uh, such a wonderful, uh, wonderfully illuminating and, and uh, should, I should say uh, erudite session today. I've learned a lot from Prof uh, Kwok. Uh, and I must say that the questions that were posed were also equally uh, uh, illuminating in that uh, comments as well as the questions that were raised um, have given us an insight into how these ancient traditions actually speak to each other and how there is this, uh, you know, despite the difference, there is so much, um, you know, mutual kind of, uh, shall we say, a, a, a harmony, uh, which immediately uh, allows us to enter that, that other tradition, that tradition that has been so uh, alien to us before, uh, and, and then it, it locks us into that tradition and makes us understand it, pick up that moment of tension uh, uh, of the conceit of the poem, as Sasi uh, rightly pointed out, and to be able to therefore, uh, in some sense, enter that whole alien world and make it our own. Just like Prof uh, Kwok said that from now on, every time he sees red earth, he somehow has already made it his own. It's part of his living vocabulary. I think similarly, all of us today will take with us something of the haiku world, something of the Chinese poetic conceit and that whole world of wild swans, I mean, wild uh, geese. Mm -hmm. So I think from now on, when I think of wild geese, I will have a whole new vocabulary of which, uh, you know, which has become a part of my vocabulary. And I think therein lies the beauty of intercultural exchanges. Th that is the value. And who more than Singaporeans can venture into these kinds of exercises because we continually live and learn from these kinds of very, very vibrant intercultural exchanges. So I want to uh, thank you, Prof. Kwok, for this wonderful session. I'm, I'm deeply grateful. Say a little about what Prof. Kwok mentioned earlier about the books available in NLP. would like to invite you all to participate in a survey. Um, you're going to be shown a QR code. You're being shown that now. So please scan the QR code or click on the link. It now remains for me to uh, thank all of you uh, for having made time to come here today. And I would also like to take this occasion to thank uh, on behalf of the Center of Singapore Tamil Culture and the National Library Board. Uh, most of all, Professor Kwok Kian Boon for making this such a memorable session and for all of you participants for your active and lively participation. Thank you very much.